1 John chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse 12 and the verses following. Looking at the subject of loving one another. Now in this fourth chapter of 1 John, we're in the middle of Paul or of John's exhortation here to love one another. And he has been encouraging us to take this step of loving each other. In our section of scripture this morning, we're going to look at the benefits of doing that. The benefits of loving one another. What are those benefits? What are the results of loving one another? Read with me, beginning in verse 12. John says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now, the results of loving others. What are these results? What are the benefits? What takes place when we love each other? There are some very specific things. Now, John addresses these issues here throughout the end of this particular chapter. And we're only going to look at just a few of these issues here in our text this morning. But notice in verse 12 that John begins with a very strange statement to begin with in this 12th verse. It's strange because you kind of wonder, well, what what is he trying to say? Why is he addressing this subject that no one has seen God at any time? I think that it's important to note that John here is really trying to get across the most important issue right off the bat of the benefit of loving one another. It allows people to see the visible love that God has towards man because God is an invisible God. He cannot be seen, but you can be seen and you can touch someone's life. And that's why his love is so important. And the benefit of you loving others is going to allow them to see the love of an invisible God manifested through your life. And that's, that's what people are looking for, is it not? I hear people all the time say to me, Steve, you know what, I don't want to hear it. I want to see it. Don't tell me how much you love me. Show me how much you love me. And I believe that is really critical. John has addressed that already in this particular uh, chapter and in this particular epistle. He has said it back in the third chapter, love not in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. And so it is essential that we have some deeds to back up our, our words. Very important. But why does he start this off with no man has seen God at any time? When you read this particular sentence, you say to yourself, well, but wait a minute. I think God, the scripture does declare that God has been seen by man. Especially those of you that are familiar with the Old Testament. Here is a passage in Genesis 32, verse 30, where after Jacob wrestled with that man all night long, and then that man turned and touched the, the hip and shriveled the, the muscle on Jacob, blessed him and changed his name from Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver, to Israel, the one who prevails with God, the one who is governed by God. There Jacob said, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And then again in Exodus 24, 
verses 9 and 10. Another example where the scripture declares that men saw God. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. What a description. So, do you see the, the apparent contradiction here in Scripture? How do you deal with this? I think that these passages of Scripture and others like them are very important because they make you dig a little deeper into the Scripture. It makes you look a little further than you would have ordinarily. And it helps you to really rightly divide the word of truth. Greek scholars declare that the word God here in, this, in our text this morning, 1 John 4.12, is without the definite article, which then describes the nature or the essence of God. And therein is the answer. No man has ever seen God in his true nature or true essence. We men have only seen that which represents God or a representation, a, a very physical example, such as when Moses was spoken to by God out of the burning bush. Now, obviously God is not a burning bush, but he was in that burning bush. And the reason why the Lord came in that way is to get Moses' attention. If you walk by a bush that was burning and it was not consumed, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? And then if God spoke out of this burning bush, you would definitely uh, be arrested in your attention. And that was the point. And so in all of these places, people have seen a representation of God, some physical representation, but they have not seen the literal glory of God. One of the best examples of this, uh, where God speaks to Moses again in Exodus 33:20, there Moses asked God to see his glory, to see him in all his glory, his essence. And what does the Lord respond to him? He says, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. I would have said, I don't want to see you then. <laughs> not right now, not this way. But what the Lord allowed was him for Moses to see his afterglow, literally, the Hebrew word describes. He said, I will pass by you. I will kind of put you over here in the cleft of the rock. I'll protect you from my glory because in your physical body you cannot see me and my essence and still live. And so he saw his afterglow. Now some of you also will say, well, wait a minute, we've seen Jesus. Jesus came, God in the flesh. And it says in Colossians 1.15 that he is the image of the invisible God. But again, we are not seeing the actual essence or glory of God. We are seeing God in the flesh of a man. But to see him as he is in himself, in all his glory, we cannot see. He is an invisible God. And thus, we need to be that example of that invisible God. You see, the scripture says that Jesus wants to come and live in me and through me. And he wants to reach out and touch people and love them just like he loves them. And what did Jesus say would be the result of that? It says in John 13, 35, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now many times people say, well, I want to see God, I want to see what he's like. And I say, well, you need to point your eyes toward Jesus, because that is who God is. That's what he's like. He is the image of that invisible God. And they say, well, but Jesus is also gone. 
He's not here any longer. And that is where you come in. That's where I come in. You see, do you see the point he's trying to get here? The point is no man can see God at any time. But men can see you. And if you love them, then they will know he is real. If we love one another, Jesus said, the world will believe the Father sent me. You see, this whole aspect and the benefit of us loving one another is an incredibly important thing. It is not a minor issue. It is the foundation of whether or not someone is going to believe that he even exists. And you're loving someone else is the proof that they're looking for to bring that convincing to their heart. It's a necessity, an absolute necessity. Now notice what he says also there in verse 12. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Now does this mean that we are going to become perfect in the flesh? Not at all. There is no sinless perfection in this life. But this word perfected, literally, the word means to be complete or to accomplish a work. So this word literally means that God is trying to accomplish a very specific work in your life. And that is to bring forth love through your life. So guaranteed, this is the number one goal that God has in his heart that his love is not perfected until it comes through you. Until it comes through you to someone else. See, just loving you is only half of the, the deal. The other half is getting that love to come out of you to someone else. Now, this is what Jesus stated in the Great Commandments. Remember those commandments? Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Those commandments are these. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? I think Jesus gave the answer, the correct answer. He said, the first commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second. So there it is. That's the issue. That's the number one issue for our personal lives. God wants me to come into a love relationship with him, but his love is not perfected until it comes out of me towards someone else. There is the ultimate end, the ultimate goal that he has for your life. Now, is that your goal? Is that the goal of your life? Is that the goal of our church? I believe that's fundamental. If there is one thing I want people to say about Calvary Chapel is that they love God and they love each other. Now, I believe that's even more important than they teach the word there. Do you know why? Because that, well, there's a lot of churches around that teach the word but it brings forth a self-righteousness in the heart. Well, we know the truth. And that self-righteousness kills the love. And it is not perfected in that heart or in that church. And so the Word of God and teaching the Word of God is not first. It's third. The first is that we love God, and that we love each other. When people rearrange that priority, it destroys the love. It destroys the whole point of why we exist individually and as a church. So make sure that your priorities are right here. Because self-righteousness resulting from knowing the truth will kill the love. If you have loving the Lord first, 
loving your neighbor secondly, well, then you're naturally going to go to the Word and say, Lord, show me, teach me how to love others. Do you see the balance there? Very, very important. Now, this love is perfected in, in us by one specific thing. It's the result of just simply abiding in the Lord. Notice again, verse 12. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. In verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him. Now notice the difference between verse 12 and verse 13. God abides in us, and we abide in him. You see, there is a big difference between the two. You see, God comes when you become a believer. And he comes to abide in you. But you then have the responsibility to abide in him. That's very important. John 15, probably the first 12 verses there, give you very specific and direct instruction as to how to abide. How do you do that? Well, it's by simple faith, by coming to him by faith. It's by simple obedience. He said, if you uh, obey my commands, you shall abide in my love. So just simply faith and obedience. That's what brings forth that overflow of God's spirit in your life and the fruit of the spirit, which is love. In John 14, 23, there Jesus said, if anyone loves me, there's the first commandment, he will keep my word, notice the priority there, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home in him. In other words, we will come and dwell inside of that individual and make our home within that person's life. Now that is the result of your relationship with him and the benefit. It touches the world. It touches the person that's sitting next to you, the person you live with, whether you're married or single. It touches the people that are around you that you care about the most. It is the issue of love. It's first and foremost, and there is where people get to see the visible love of an invisible God who is real. Now secondly, the second benefit he describes here in verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now as you love others, God's spirit is manifested in your life. Now this is one of the greatest blessings that could possibly be to experience the the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is the difference between Christianity and every other religious system on the planet. Because every other religious system is saying, well, you need to do this or change that or have this kind of behavior. But they don't give you the power to do it. Christianity is just the opposite. God says, this is what I want to do in your life. And I'm going to give you the power to do it. I'm going to come and live inside you and empower you to love in this manner. And as you do, I'm just going to continue to manifest more of my spirit in your life as you do just that. Now, this issue of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you is the proof that you are truly His. Now you remember I shared with you at the outset of this epistle as we began to study it that one of John's primary purposes for writing this epistle was to assure believers that they were true believers and to refute the false teachers that were in those days. We'll come to this in 1 John chapter 5 right at the very end, verse 13 where he says, These things I have written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, God wants us to know. John wanted us to know. I hope you want to know. 
Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? Are you absolutely sure you are a believer? How do you know? Well, this is one of several ways that John laid out here in this epistle is by the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Do you sense the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life? Because that proves that you are His. It says in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 9, and specifically in verse 8, he says, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. That says it pretty clearly, pretty directly. The issue is, I must have the Holy Spirit. And I must, when he is inside, you know what he does? He is the one that bears witness to the fact that you are his. In Romans 8, 16, a few verses down from this last passage I read, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Have you had that witness of the Holy Spirit in your personal life that confirms to you, yes, you're His. You're truly a child of God. Have you sensed that overflow of the Spirit of God coming out of you? Have you, you sensed the ability that He gives you to love someone that is really hard to love? Have you sensed that? You see, that is the proof that you truly do know Him. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, there Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? What a, what a powerful truth is that. Just like there was a temple built in Jerusalem that housed the literal presence, the Shekinah presence of God, you are the physical temple. And inside of you dwells the spirit of the living God. And that is what makes you a Christian. It what's, it's what makes you different from somebody that is in this world that does not know him. You see, we are more than students reading a book or studying some philosophy. We're more than just someone observing what God is doing here in the earth. God is doing a work and it's inside of us. That's where the work begins. And that work then must proceed out from you. Now one of the most comforting things is to know that God is working in me. That I don't have to try and work it up myself. It says in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I love that passage. And back in chapter 1, he said that he was confident that he which had begun a good work would complete it. Are you confident of that? That God is working in you and the, what he is doing inside of you, he's going to complete He's not going to give up. He's not going to give up on what he's trying to do in your life. So don't you give up. Let him finish the work that he's accomplished. Let him complete that work. And the primary work is teaching you how to love the person sitting next to you, the person that's at home, the person that you work with, wherever and whoever you come in contact with. God wants to work this work in you. Now, are we perfect at that? Absolutely not. We are, there's nobody in this room that's perfect at it because we have all of us those times. You probably had this past week where you got upset with someone, you got angry, and anything but the love of God was coming out of you, right? I had one of those experiences myself. And you know what you do? 
you just have to say, you know what, Lord, there's something wrong here. This is not your purpose. This is not your will. This is not right. And I'm not going to excuse it or rationalize it or justify it. I'm just going to say, Lord, forgive me. And I'm going to go and ask that person to forgive me. And I'm going to get it right. I'm going to return to abiding in the Lord. Because when you're in that state, you're not abiding. Because you're not obeying the command to love. And so if you want to go back to that place of abiding, you have to obey God's, all of God's commands, which means to be honest, to repent, to humble yourself. So let him do it. Let him produce the love of God. Choose to allow that love to come out towards someone else. If it's not happening, return to abiding, and it will. The third and last result is really the overflow of what I've just shared with you. To become bold as a witness that the Father has sent the Son. Now as you read this, look at verse 14. He, he just, John just really is just overflowing in this statement when he says, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. I mean, John is just preaching here. He's just excited. And he is making a statement here that is a capital offense under the Roman Empire. What do I mean by that? Well, the Caesars all declared, they dictated that no one was to call anyone else Lord or Savior under the penalty of death. You see, the Christians who were fed to the lions in that first century, they, all they had to do was say, Caesar is Lord, and they would have been spared. All they had to do is say, Caesar is our Savior, and they would have been set free. But they refused. Why was that? You know, I stood in the Colosseum here two years ago, and I thought to myself, what commitment. I mean, this place, it just reeked of commitment. That's all I could see here was the commitment of believers. They've got a little cross that is set over to the side where the throne of Caesar Augustus once stood. And that cross is standing there today in place of his throne. And I, I like that. But I thought to myself, you know, what commitment? What motivated these people to make that commitment? Because they knew the Lord. God dwelt in them. There was a reality. There was a power that they knew was real. And they weren't willing to give it up. You see, when you experience and express God's love, you become bold and confident because God dwells in you. And you cannot be silent. You will testify just like John does here in verse 14. You will testify that the Father sent the Son. And it will produce a boldness inside of you that can come by no other means. That boldness you can't work up. It's what enables you to testify even in the face of those that mock you and ridicule you. I, I experience this when we go out on the pier during the summertime and we share the gospel. I know in years past, you know, you go out there and sometimes you're not really walking in the spirit one day. You're not really filled to overflowing. And you're going out because that's what you're doing. And you know what happens when somebody begins to cuss you out or they mock you or they say something mean to you? It's like this wave. Have you ever felt that wave? And it's just like, oh, you know, it's like somebody just kind of sitting on your chest. And you don't really have a real excitement about going and doing that again to the next person. <laughs> There's not a lot of boldness there. And that happens again, and pretty soon you kind of go, wow, maybe I should just, you know, pack it in tonight. But you see, 
The only thing that enables you to keep doing that when you're getting that response is basically it's just the love of God. When you are filled with love, you love them more than the hate that's come in your direction. And it overpowers the situation and it overpowers you. And you can walk away and say, well, God still loves you. And because that love is abiding in you. That's what gives you that boldness. Love, the love of God filling your heart. So if you sense that, you know, that resistance and you feel like just kind of backing off when you're sharing, just pray for one thing. Just say, Lord, fill me with your love. Because that love is the fruit of his spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is what? It's boldness. It's boldness. In Acts 4, we have a great example of this where the disciples are being persecuted for their faith and they are told basically to be quiet. Don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And this is Peter's response. Acts 4.20 For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And they took them, beat them anyway. And it says in Acts 4.29 they prayed and they said, Lord, look on their threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. See, where does he get that? It's from the Spirit of God. It's from the power of the Spirit in his life and the love that they had in their hearts for these that they shared with. Now, I think that it's important also that you have this same boldness. And all you have to do to find it, to experience it, is just pray. You have not because you ask not. Ask that your joy may be full. Ask that the power of the Spirit may come upon you. Now notice this last verse here in verse 15. He says, whoever. Notice, now here's kind of a challenge to all of us or to anyone that would read this epistle. He says, I'm testifying to you that Jesus is the Son of God and that God the Father sent him. Notice what he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now this is important because I believe that most individuals do not truly understand biblically what it means to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. The reason I say that is because I've asked people many times. They say, well, I, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they'll say to me, well, and I'll, I'll respond and I'll say, well, what does that mean? What do you mean Jesus is the Son of God? What does that term really mean to you? And many times people will say, well, you know, he's God's Son. But that doesn't tell me anything. What does it mean to believe and confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Very important. In John 20, verse 31, there is a definition given to us in Scripture of what this does mean. There, John said, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, simply stated, the terms the Christ and the Son of God are synonymous terms. He said, if you may that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So to believe and confess that Jesus is the Son of God simply means that you believe that he is the Messiah. He is the promised one that was promised in the Old Testament through all the prophecies. He is the Messiah. But that means if you believe that he is the Messiah, you must believe that he is God come in human flesh. Why do I say that? Because the primary chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah 35, that describes the work of the Messiah that is to come the healing, the raising people from the dead, and so on. All of the things that Jesus did. He states there in Isaiah 35, verse 4, Our God shall come, and he will do these things. And I encourage you, 
Go read the chapter. Read that verse in its context. It is absolutely clear the Messiah was to be God come to earth. Unmistakable. Jesus made it just as clear. In John 8, 24, he said, Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. He's declaring something very specific. They took up stones. They wanted to stone him. They clearly understood what he meant. Because he was a man claiming to be equal with God. And so this statement, to believe that he is the I am, this term, the I am, is God's name throughout all generations. In Exodus 3.14, when Moses spoke to God there out of the burning bush, he asked him the question, what is your name? And God responded, I am that I am. This is my name throughout all generations. So when Jesus claimed to be the I am, they all understood exactly what he was declaring. Now, how does that relate to the term, the Son of God? Turn with me in your Bibles. Keep your finger here in 1 John and turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 16 through 30. These passages make it absolutely clear what it means to believe that Jesus is the Son of God when he claimed that God was his personal Father, making himself obviously the Son of God. Now Jesus had just healed a man on the Sabbath day. And it says there in verse 16, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus, sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father, not our Father, notice he says, My Father, has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they clearly understood what he was claiming. He was claiming equality with God because he said, my father, not our father. And they make this they, uh, John here makes this statement. Now notice, as you read down a few verses more, verse 21, here is where he makes the actual claims of equality with God. He says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. In other words, as the Father resurrects people from the dead, so he resurrects them from the dead. Only God can raise someone from the dead. In verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. You see, only God is the judge of all men. But Jesus said, The Father has committed all judgment to the Son. Another equality. Verses 23 and 24. He says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So Jesus claims equality in honor. And so I always say to those that are in the cults, I ask them, do you honor Jesus as you honor the Father? Are they equal? Because if not then you are not honoring the Father. Verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And so here Jesus declares that he has life in himself. He is the source of life, just as the Father is the source of life. Do you see these four aspects of total equality? that Jesus makes here. They understood what he was claiming and he made sure that they heard the claims in very specific terms so that there was no doubt about this issue. Now, does it make a difference whether you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? God come in human flesh? Absolutely. 
It will determine your eternal salvation. If Jesus said, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. That makes it pretty clear. To believe and to confess this is essential for you as a believer. Notice also in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, when Philip is ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch, he shares the gospel message with him, and the Ethiopian eunuch said, here's water, what would keep me from being baptized? And Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it is not enough to just confess with your mouth words. You have to believe in your heart. You have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, as it declares in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that this is an essential thing for a believer. Anyone can make a confession. Anyone can know that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, even the demons. I mean, the devil knows Jesus is the Son of God. He has this knowledge, and he believes that he is the Son of God. But you have to believe in your heart, your heart of hearts. One is just an acknowledgement. The other is a commitment of your life is the surrender of your life, the surrender of your heart to believe that. And that is what salvation is really all about. I encourage you this morning, for those of you that are questioning or wondering, you know, is Jesus really the Son of God? Well, let me say to you, He has the proof. He has the credentials. He's the only one who has an empty tomb. All the other religious leaders are either in their tomb or they've been cremated. Every one of them. But there is no tomb for Jesus because he's alive. And that is the big difference. I encourage you this morning. Open your heart to him. Allow him to come in and fill you with his spirit, which will produce his love, which will only give you assurance that you are His. Let's pray together.